Hi guys, Jeff Sokol here. We have a property of a client right here in that's located in uh, in South Central Colorado, and or almost almost Southwest Colorado. But anyway, th this property is located in in a uh, in in Colorado, and and we had a really good time designing this property. And uh, and I just want to let you know what what it is that we're doing here. So if you're considering a permaculture design. You can check out check out this one, maybe get some ideas, and uh, maybe give us a call, see if we can help you out. So what we we did was we we first thing we did was we went and we got our shot from Google Earth, and and we looked at the property and and um and when I get on Google Earth, I can see the elevations uh, down to the foot. Okay, it's not super precise, but what this is, this isn't a, a full permaculture design. What this is, is called a framework. Okay, so it's much less expensive than a full design. Um, I put a lot of the same stuff in there, um, it, and but the bottom line is is that that this is called a framework design, and and it's going to give you, you know, a basic layout. But I still like to be accurate on on how I lay out my uh, how I lay out the earthworks. Okay, or as accurate as I can be from from here. What this allows me to do is be able to uh, to do framework designs across the world without having to go anywhere. So if somebody presents me with a topo map, that's even better. But with this right here, we could, I can still use Google Earth and it shows me the elevation right down here on, on the bottom. So what will take place is I can just run the cursor around the property and see what the lengths are and, and see what the, uh, I, I, can, I can check distance on this thing. And, and it just allows me to, to, to get a feel for the layout of the property even better. So here's what the property looks like uh, from the image that I got off of Google Earth. I sanitized it a little bit, got some of the cars out there and stuff like that. And then w when I did the design, it ended up looking like this. So let's go ahead and we'll go ahead and walk through this design together. And, uh, and I'll explain to you how I came up with it and how it works. Okay, so what we have here, we have the we have the the entire design, and and right here on the right hand side, we have the write up that I do about the design, and which I give to all the clients. Okay, so not only are you going to get your design with a legend on the side of it that's going to, you know, to where you can kind of see where everything is and what everything is. This is all sent to you digitally, obviously, so you can enlarge it and stuff like that and check it out. And match it up with with the uh, with the explanations of, of the things that we have going on. Now, um, the first thing I do is is that I will I will create a document um, af after I finish with the design. I'll create a document that's going to give a, a, the basic synopsis of the of the property where it's located, and and then we'll start talking about the features of the property. But more importantly the different types of trees and different types of bushes and, and uh, all the vegetation that we can use as well as livestock and soils and, and, um, and things of that nature. Uh, fish, legumes, all that stuff. Then I'll give a, um, I got this from Trio, which is pretty cool. Uh, thank you Trio for putting this out there. And, and what it allows me to do is just give them an idea very quickly of the different levels of food forest. Um, then we talk briefly about the guilds, and this is this is a, this is really cool. I got this off of Pinterest. I'm sorry, I don't know who made it, um, but but this is a, a a great little little deal for uh, fruit tree guilds, and so so it gives them a basic layout of their property and how permaculture is going to help their property. Okay, so then we go into the design itself, and we'll start talking about the design. So I, sep I segregate this out into different areas. Okay, so for this one, it's going to be this is going to be area one here, and I think on on uh, this one, yeah. Okay, so we'll use this. And so you see here on the left hand side that inside this livestock paddock, it says area one. This is area two, and this is area three, right? So areas one two and three which i'm pretty sure yeah okay cool so i've got that right there so they can see for reference so area one we'll start talking about that and then area two we'll go into more detail about area two 
and, um, and why I designed it this way and how it flows and, and, um, and then area three, then it, it, we can see exactly in area three, you know, why the design is that way again. So we can go through that right now. And, uh, and so you can see for this design, what my thought processes were and, and why I put the property in, in this way. And you also, you know, I get criticism because I, I use Microsoft paint in this thing. And, it, and, and again, this is a framework only design. It's not a, uh, a, a full scale commercial permaculture design, um, uh, with using CAD and stuff like that. Uh, the reason I don't use landscaping software is because I've been using paint since I was a little kid and, and, and it works, you know, there's, there's nothing that I'm doing in here that needs to be so precise. Um, uh, as far as art is concerned, that, that it's, that, that it's going to give a, a better representation of what it is we're trying to accomplish. Um, you know, we have the right up here and then we have the, then we have the design on the other side. And, and so then when I make this video, you know, I'm going to send this video to Maxi as well. And so when, when they see the video, then they're really going to understand, um, it, you know, exactly what we're trying to get across here and the importance of certain things and, and, um, and, and what it is that we're doing and why. Okay. So that's why I use paint. I like paint. And, um, if you don't like paint, then use whatever you want to use. Okay. So let's just start off here. We're going to start off here in, uh, I guess it makes sense to start off with zone one. So zone one, here's the, here's the house. So coming out of the, this, the, uh, the client wanted to leave this area as a garage. Okay. So they're going to be putting a, a garage in, in, in this spot here, uh, to, I think they want to work on cars or something. So coming up the driveway here, there's, there's a bunch of big shade trees all around the house in the front yard. It's a beautiful home. Um, so we're not going to, we're not going to mess with those. Those shade trees keep the house cool in the summertime. And so we're just going to leave all that stuff as it is. Uh, we don't want to take out any of those big trees if we don't have to. So coming out the, coming up the driveway here, we go into, into the, um, into area one. And we'd start off, they have a garden shed. Okay, so the garden shed right there is, is, you know what garden sheds are for. They're to keep your equipment, your tools, and stuff like that. This gray outline right here is not an outline. What that is, it's a walking path. So, you know, we've had some clients that, that enjoy putting down limestone or sidewalk or pavers or whatever the case is that, that makes it easier to traverse their property, especially if they're going to be using a wheelbarrow and stuff like that, and they don't want to get muddy all the time. So the... This right here, going around here, is a walking path. This tan line on the inside of that walking path is actually um, is actually fence line because these people are in Colorado, and so in Colorado there's a lot of deer, and the deer will, uh, you know, completely terrorize your gardens, and and you know you'll get those tomatoes up about that big, and then all of a sudden they're looking beautiful and lush and green and strong and dark green and, and wonderful, and then the next morning they're that tall because a deer came through and ate your tomatoes. So to prevent that, we fence off the garden area, okay? On the right-hand side here, we, we um, you can see on our key, we call those ground gardens. That's where we put veggies, um, you know, just kind of, some people like to use, um, they like to scatter you know, so what they'll do is they'll scatter their seed and kind of whatever grows, grows, whatever they kick over, um, they, they, they eat for dinner kind of thing. And, and you can put medicinal herbs in there, um, some medicinal flowers, um, just make it beef forage if you want to. And so it's kind of a, it's kind of a catch all, uh, spot, kind of whatever you want to experiment with. Um, we, we put those out there, but most all the time they include they include some sort of flowers and um which as you well know i'm sure it can also have uh have multiple uses on the right side of that we put a sound uh, a um a, a hedge which is going to buffer the sound and it's going to buffer the um and you know obviously it's going to it's going to hinder the the visibility from the business that's next door because there is an industrial space 
um, next door to that. So if you don't want those people peeping in on you, that's what we have this um, privacy screen for. So these are fairly good sized beds in here and they should be able to grow all of the annual crops that they're going to need um, as far as vegetables are concerned. And of course, between these, you can always trellis between these. If you put a four foot path in between all of these, you can trellis over it with a cattle panel, okay? And that's just a cheap, easy way to make a trellis, but you can put uprights in between here, trellis all this stuff if you want to. Um, you, you can trellis, really all of these walkways can be trellised uh, to, to some extent, just watch out for your sun. So uh, just just be careful of your sunlight and um, and how it's going to affect the the uh, all, all of the other plants and, and then you'll be good to go. They have a greenhouse okay so the greenhouse obviously depending on the t style of greenhouse can be used for for propagating cuttings it, they can be used um, for starting seeds and and even growing growing food um, all through the winter as well so so when I talked to the client we did talk about being able to put together um, you know, geothermal style greenhouses that will allow them to circulate air and, and use the earth underneath the greenhouse as a uh, as an earth battery, which is going to keep the heat throughout the year. Okay, and then it's going to release it whenever it gets cold. So, so there, there's a this property, by the way, the entire property is two acres. So we're cramming a lot of stuff into into small acreage here, but it, it can totally work. Um, and, and again, when we put together a framework design, I'm letting you know what's possible, okay? And somebody may take a look at this and say, hey, why didn't you do this? You should have done it this way, whatever. Guys, it's art, okay? It's art. So, so this, these are suggestions. This is the way I visualize the property. And, uh, and I know that, that this will work. So um, north of the greenhouse, they have a poultry pen. And so in the poultry pen, you could, you could put different fruit trees. Um, you know, I remember in Mississippi, we had, we, we had um, yaupon holly. And so we actually made the chicken pen around the yaupon holly because the, the, it would make berries every year, and the chickens loved the berries. Um, also, you can put a hedge on the other side of the chicken pen, which is going to allow it to... Um, uh, it, it's going to be a it's going to be a wind barrier for one, and then at the same time, if it's productive, it can produce food that the chickens will also eat. Outside of there, there's going to be a compost pile. Okay, so they can do all their compost work right there, which is which is going to make it very easy to be able to bring the waste greens from the garden, uh, feed the chickens with them, and be able to collect the manure from the chicken coop and bring it right to the compost, okay? And, and while all of the waste greens from the greenhouse in the garden can go to the, uh, they can turn into eggs, all right? Eggs and, and more compost. To the left of that, what we see is a livestock paddock. Now the livestock paddock, we talked about having a couple of goats. Um, the, the goats, obviously you can plant, this is, this is all fenced and the goats will will browse on whatever you plant in here and on the outside of here as well. Um, if you don't want to look at your goats all the time, you can plant a good hedge on this side as well. Then, um, and I would suggest that all of these plants, to some extent, be productive. Um, these plants on the inside can be annuals; they, they can be perennials; they can be things that that you plant every year, like like uh, like beans, for example that are gonna grow up the fences and everything else and give the goats something to browse on. This is a big enough area. If you only have a couple of goats, two or three goats, then then they should allow all of this stuff to, to grow um, to where it will cover the fences, and which makes the whole thing aesthetically pleasing. I would also trellis this area here, up this walkway. There's, in during this whole space right here, you can trellis this this is probably a solid 30 feet um, right here between these uh, between the livestock paddock fence and the garden fence. 
So if you trellis those areas, you'll you'll be able to have a, a tunnel that you can walk through that you can plant on this side, on the on the garden side, and have it tre in like uh, gourds or melons or something cool like that. Or even wisteria may grow, because they're in zone six. I think wisteria may grow in zone six, but it might be zone seven. But something that's going to be aesthetically pleasing and provide some shade and and, um, and provide some functionality as well. So they they can put that there. Now moving forward, for, well you know what? let's back up for a second. On the west side of the property, we have a privacy screen, and also um, it could be a windbreak. The water runs off of the street and goes down here. It runs down the uh, down this entire side and has created its own little tiny little gully where the water runs. Now, what the what the client told me is that she notices that this water runs, and typically the water runs straight down this hill here. And there there was a little berm here, as we can see. So typically the water would run straight down here and it would fill this area up and then just run off. Okay. And it would run off and it would, it would go down, it would go down to the river from, um, from there. So down here we have, we have a river back here. Okay. And so this river will, um, uh, is, is where this stuff all ends up going. It goes down this wash and goes in, goes into the river. Well, every time that it rains, that means that they're losing soil, okay? Because that's just the, the way that it's that, that it's operating right now. So what we're going to do is pick up this water that's coming that's coming through here through this little gully and going down here and, and washing out into this little bermed area. We're going to completely rearrange the entire thing, and that's that's exactly what we've done here, as as you can see. So we burn this up a little bit and make sure that we guide this water exactly where we want it to go, okay? And the first swale that we have is at 5380, okay? And so at 5380 on contour here, as we can tell from Google Earth, we put in a swale. So we're catching this water as it's coming through the goat pin here. And this, this only happens really on major events. Okay, so so they get a good rain, a good solid rain, and it's gonna it, and it's gonna wash through here, and go to this first swale. The, the swale picks it up, and on contour, it's gonna it's gonna spread out across here, which is which is a, a good distance. I want to say this is probably 150 feet of swale right here, and then we're gonna berm up a little bit. On contour, we have a we have a a level spillway here, and then it's going to slope down here. Um, and this is a pretty decent drop, so it's a three it's a three foot drop from here to here, which is why these are so close together. Okay. Now, being that they're so close together, we don't have a whole lot of space to do to do a whole lot of things with it. So we put a small no till grain and cover crop area here, which which is a tenth of an acre or something like that. All right. So when we look at this, and again, this is a suggestion. This is not written in stone. None of this is written in stone. But this is what I saw when I visualized the whole thing. So what we're able to do is pick up the water, and it's going to flow this way. Go down a level sill uh, spillway. We're going to berm up on both sides here to make sure that the water flows down to three feet where we want it to go. And that's a pretty quick drop, right? And so. We're gonna have to berm up a little extra heavy on this side and let it come back across. Another level still spillway here at, at 53.77. Comes down, drops another three feet. And we, we pick it up in another swale, okay? Now when we pick it up in this third swale, it's, we have a walking path alongside this swale. And this swale will run all the way down to another level sill spillway that will empty out into our pond. Now, as you recall, we have this area here, and we just all we did was we opened this up a little bit and turned it into a pond. They're gonna have to dig that pond out 
and uh, to get the soil to put against the back here and make a make a levee, make a larger levee. But all this is done on contour. Okay. Now for so let's go back here. We have our walking paths and we have the little bridges that go over the swales and make everything nice and cute. Um, and this right here is a food forest. On the, on the left hand side is a food forest and in zone two, it's a complete food forest, the whole thing. Um, and, and, and again, no-till grain and cover crops. So what, are they, what is this gonna do for them? The no-till grain and cover crop area is going to provide feed for the winter time for their uh, for their chickens and their ducks and their and their livestock and stuff like that okay so that should be plenty to be able to provide the grains that they're going to want for sprouting and they can use a um a fodder system even to sprout the greens i mean sprout, sprout the grains to where they can uh where they can you know get a lot more nutrition for the same seed okay now again all these in uh, in these food forests. This is all. All of these trees are gilded, um, and as they mature, then they can start running chickens and goats through here and stuff like that. Zone three. What we have is the um, is we have some more of these of these ground gardens. Um, I would make these ground gardens as diverse as possible. And the reason is because the more diversity that you have in the ground garden, um, the more flowers that you have and in, in stuff like that, it's not only is it more beautiful, but at the same time, it, uh, it becomes a much healthier area. This part of Colorado is, is fairly dry. So we have some, uh, some secret tricks that, that we do that I haven't seen anybody else doing in the, in the industry. Um, but we have some things that we do on our gardens that make these things drought proof almost immediately. Now they do have shares of water coming out of this irrigation ditch. So they would be able to fill these swales without having to wait. Um, so th these, this irrigation ditch opens up in the, um, in April. So they would be able to fill these swales with uh, just pumping the water up and sit it through the entire system and then it'll just run back out of the system whenever um, as the as the pond fills up so this um but they, they so that this is good because they have the ability to keep water on the property but if they didn't have that really we would just need one major rain event and this property will be drought proofed um with the with the things that we do to the property okay and that which does include tilling once so we give it a one initial till we put some things in the soil we put some different amendments in the soil that are organic that allow for a uh, a first time um almost it, it's an it's an immediate effect okay that, that water is going to stay in the landscape for a very very long time um until it's until it's necessary to be used so by that by that principle and these things that we do in permaculture here, soils are natural. They slowly hydrate the landscape and, and all that stuff, and they're wonderful, okay? They're necessary for drought proofing the property. But the other stuff that we do, even in desert situations, uh, call it West Texas or, or anywhere you put it, you can save 90% of the water that you would be using um, even, even without swales. Okay. Uh, and it's, and they last for five years. All right. So these are things that, that, that we do that we, we know work that we've seen work and in that we're really excited about the prospects of using, using it on a large scale. It's not super cheap, but what you get in return for it and, and the, the property value that you get from having this lush abundance um, be, being the only green spot in the United States, or uh, sorry, in that in that area rather, the only green spot when everything else around you is brown, that's that's a good good deal. 
So if we're looking at properties in Wyoming so, or, or, or properties out in West Texas and, you know, place they get 13, 14 inches of rain a year, what we're able to do is create a situation where that property is still green and lush when everything else next to it is brown. Okay, so if you have a hunting place in South Texas or West Texas and you can create an opportunity for the deer for your for this two acres, for example, or five acres or 50 acres to be lush and green, whereas your neighboring property is going to is still going to be is, is going to be super dry. Where do you think the deer are going to migrate to? They're going to come to your property so they can eat what you have, so they can eat what's on your land. And so that's what, when we look at these things, we look at these things to where we design it for, for the space, okay, and for the use that's intended by the client. So in this particular situation, the, the person is going to use this for their family, and they, they plan on having children later, and I can't imagine a better, cooler place for kids to grow up in than towering food forests, walking paths, um, you know, these, these, these little micro pastures with tons of wildflowers growing up in them and, and nut trees and fruit. It's a Garden of Eden. Garden of Eden. Now, now check, check this out. We're giving them chinampas, all right? These are willow trees or, or they could even be bald cypress. It's a good zone four. So bald cypress would work right here as well, which is a beautiful tree. Um, but but willow is a great permaculture tree, right? Because there's a lot of cool stuff we can make with willow. So with the so with these willows here kind of hanging over, I want you to imagine, you know, a small pond that that has you know, five to eight feet deep that has you know some catfish in it or whatever, but it's got these willow trees just just draped over it, and um, and being able to you know, walk out on these chinampas and put chairs out there and chill and sit in, you know, garden and, and have trellises on, between the chinampas. Okay, so you trellis over the chinampas and you can have gourds and melons hanging or whatever it is. You, you can grow cuckoo melon, okay, which is a cool little fruit that, that'll grow over there. And it's about this, it looks like a mini watermelon. It's about that big. It's going to be an annual in zone six. But at the same time, you can start them in the, uh, you can totally start them in the greenhouse, get them to where they're sizable and plant them up in the chinampas and, and have them become an annual. And that'll be a, uh, that'll be a cool little, you know, cool little deal that you can, that, that you can put there. But, but anything that you want to grow on a trellis can grow on there as well, you know, even grapes and stuff like that. So, so that's going to be a really neat little situation for them. Um, our edge plantings and stuff. And you know, all there's lots of different water plants that are cold hardy, um, that that are that are annual or I say, I say annual. They come out once a year, but the, but they're perennial. That uh that, that we can plant on the side, cattails, rushes, stuff like that. And you can find permaculture pond plants um, all all over the internet. Uh, here is a sitting area, right here. So they walk through here, and in my vision, they're then and these bushes these they don't have to be low these, these can be as tall as you want them to be these can be towering trees if you want them if you want them to be the um what do you call those things it can be junipers they can be um they have those cypress trees that, that grow straight up you know anything you want this property to look like it can look like so if you want seclusion walking through here and you want to make your property feel a lot bigger than it actually is, do stuff like that. Make it to where you can't see across the entire property and it's going to have a much larger feel. And so you walk through, you can wind through here, There's, put a little sitting area here, okay, and do whatever you want there. Um, they're in Colorado, so if they're, if they're into it, they can, I don't know, smoke pot right there or whatever. It, that'd be fun for some people. Um, and this and another walking path can go in, into their, their other food forest here. Okay. Um, now, I put a swale alongside this ditch just to keep as much water on property as possible and as much water backed up, in, um, not to make a marshy area, 
Um, but if they wanted it to be, it could be, it, you know, if, if it came to that. If enough water came out here and stayed on and stayed in this area on contour, then it, then it, it totally would be a marshy area because I don't think there's very much drop between here and here. Um, but but it's it's enough to drain it for sure. So it's just another little spot that can be hedged off, and and what would it will allow for is to is to just have you know another little area of seclusion um, and. You know, I want you to envision this for a second. If you scatter your seed in here and some stuff takes, some stuff doesn't take, you, you throw cowpea on the ground, you throw uh, squash seeds on the ground, you throw pumpkin on the ground, you throw watermelon, okay? Some stuff's going to germinate and some stuff isn't. However, it's a, you know, you put onion seeds out there, but it's a pretty neat idea that you can go out there, walk around, and look on the ground and see tomatoes, zucchini, uh, you know, see cucumbers and, and stuff like that, that and, and, you know, growing on top of one another and, and just in, in a completely wild environment. You have the room to do it. Why not do it? Okay, it's going to create additional fertility. It's going to be food for local wildlife, um, and it's going to be—it's just going to be all around awesome sauce for you and, and your and your property. Okay, you have strawberries growing out there. Whatever it is you want, this is a in a super super abundant garden of Eden. Okay, now so, now one thing I, I wanted to point out is since this right here. As we see right here, this is a natural spillway down down to here. Now we messed it up, okay? We we messed up that natural spillway. We made it run slowly across the landscape, is what we did, all right? Which is fine. That's what we're supposed to be doing. But since that's where the water wants to run, another designer might have said, okay, I'm going to put a swale right here, and then it's going to go down into this swale. But this swale is going to have a so like this well right here could have a dam right here, okay? So there could be a, 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 a whole other pond right here that's dammed up on this back side. Do you see that? So there could be a whole other situation that would allow that that would allow a dam to, to be in this in, in 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 this spot here, okay? So when I say a dam, all I mean is another pond. So that's where it's naturally wanting to be. Why not dam it up right there and create a situation that, that gives you just another large body, I say large, just another body of water, all right? And then when it fills up, it's going to continue to run down this swale and, and run back out of here, but it's just more water storage on the property and somebody might want that, okay? And look, I'm not an expert on what everybody wants. I'm an expert on permaculture. So, so in, in seeing, I can see the design. I can see the potential and the, and the opportunity for it to be amazing and lush and green and awesome. And, and is it going to be 100% tidy? No, but nature is not 100% tidy. In between all these trees and these fruit trees and stuff like that and these nut trees, it's not going to be 100% tidy. But we can graze it. Okay, we can graze it and make it as tidy as we want it to be, all right? But but this right here, I mean, you can mulch the entire thing if you want to, if you want to, um, and turn this into an, an orchard with rows, if that's if that's your thing, okay? Again, this is simply a a, a framework. This is an outline, and and this shows you what's possible. If you want it to be natural looking and abundant and and be able to have more food than you could ever give away, then do this. Okay? Then do this. And this is and this is going to work. It says multiple stories in, in the in um, in the food forest. So we just designed the food forest the way it's supposed to be designed. In a few years, we're gonna flood out the light that that, that gets to the floor and then you'll be able to graze that stuff through and, and, and where you're going to have a lot more leaf litter on the ground. In 10 years, you're going to have a total canopy in there.
okay so so though it, it'll take 10 years for for it to get really big and they and they get really um really really fertile this is a an amazing amazing start and all we need is water which you have very luckily which you have so that's pretty awesome of course off the greenhouse and stuff like that okay we can have water catchment systems all over okay so you can be water catchment on the house it can be water catchment on the greenhouse it's pretty easy to it's pretty easy to install that stuff so i did not put that in in, in the design because it's something that um that that she can do so going back to this you see here that that these different swales that we have these little i call them kind of intermediate swales this right here this little outlet this is when the when the this pond gets too full it's going to come out of a pvc pipe on this side and it's going to dump into here and will be picked up by this swale which is going to go into here and drain back out this way now could i have made it just run down there yeah sure but what's the fun in that no let's pick it up let's keep that water on the property as long as we can okay uh her husband operates heavy machinery and so and and he knows how to operate that stuff so so they're not going to have a massive cost in doing the earthworks because he should be able to handle the earthworks all right so there we go is 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 we just keep the water on the property as long as as long as we can and um and with this right here there's a in major events water is going to flow from the neighboring property and come through here and also continue to hydrate and and look is he going to hydrate the downslope more than the upslope yes but we we wouldn't have this awesome production of this swale side either okay so i'm all about productive plants on the swales you know it, they they lock in the they lock in the fertility they lock in the they, they they lock in the swale with their roots but but here's the thing look at all these plants those those could be berries those could be lemongrass those, those could be catnip they, those could be those could be blueberry bushes you know um there's so many different productive things that they could be it's it's kind of ridiculous to sit here and, and try to think of them all but but the bottom line is it's there you know it's there and it works um and so it just gives us that extra production you know now with all of this food that we're producing we can totally go in and, and um and and invite people to come in church members or, or whoever you want to come in, pick the food and, and, and give it to the local homeless shelter or give it to the local church or give it to whoever is in need of your surplus. Okay. Let's not forget that your surplus is going to fall on the ground if you don't use it. And then when it falls on the ground, a couple things are going to happen. You can, number one, it's gonna it's gonna compost it's, it's gonna it's gonna turn back into soil obviously but nobody wants to walk under an apple tree that just had you know 600 apple 600 apples fall on the ground okay it, that it gets messy so what these guys could do is number one in this livestock paddock they could have a couple of pigs and then they can run pigs from one side to the other side um inside inside of fences all right, so we can put net, we can put some electric nets up and run pigs inside of each of these paddocks. And how many paddocks do you have? Here's one right here. That could be a paddock. This could be a whole other paddock. This could be a paddock, and this could be a paddock. Okay, that you run your pigs through, and and your pigs will gladly eat all the fruit that's on the ground, and they turn it into bacon. And so, so now we have pigs running through here. We can have. Um, if you have a cow, you know, it, have a dairy cow, a dairy cow could run through there also and eat some of the grass. The, uh, and again, guys, we're not talking about a massive, a, a massive uh, piece of ground here. We're only talking about, right here is about an acre and a half. All right. So we're not talking about a ton of space. So we can't have 20 cows. We can't even have 20 goats. You know, I mean, I'm sure you could have 20 goats, but, 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 but just, you get my point. Is that we're not talking about a massive piece of ground here we're just talking about um a, a relatively small piece of ground compared to a farm but here's the thing 
that we can utilize these things as they, um, you know, very, very efficiently by, by just minimizing what we have. You have a couple of pigs and, um, you know, three or four pigs can go through there and, and just take care of the whole deal. But then, in, but in, in, uh, then all your produce is cleaned up. So you can turn it into bacon. You can run your chickens through there, turn it into eggs. You can collect it. You can sell it. Um, my uncle had uh, 20 acres of orange trees, all right? And those orange trees, he, didn't, he wasn't in the orange business, but he bought a house, and the house happened to come with an orchard. And so what he did was he called up his buddy that, that runs the, um, uh, his buddy was a sheriff. So he calls up, he calls up his buddy and they send prisoners over there to go and pick all the oranges and clean up the place. My uncle donates the oranges to the parish for the jails in Louisiana. And he got it. And so he got market value for the oranges in the form of a donation. He got market value uh, back to him in the form of a tax credit. Okay, it's actual taxes he didn't have to money that he didn't have to come out of pocket on, and he needed the and he needed the tax credit, and so that allowed him to get a tax credit, and he didn't have to do anything. Just let the oranges make oranges. The prisoners came and picked all the oranges for free, donated it, and you know he signed the thing, donated it to the parish. The parish used it in, in schools and in, and in prisons, and he gets a massive tax credit for like the oranges are worth like one hundred and forty thousand dollars, and that was a credit that he got. Okay, it's not a write off, a credit. So. If he hadn't done that, he, it would have cost him an additional, an additional hundred forty thousand dollars in taxes that year. You see, but he got it. He got the credit from the oranges. You can do the same thing. You can do the same thing. So, so this right here. And look, guys, I'm not a CPA. Ask your ask your uh, tax advisor about that. But but if uh, if that's something you want to do, don't don't take my word for it. Make sure it's right where you are. But here's the thing, is that there's lots of there's lots of options here. So when we're looking at their options, we can see that number one, there's a ton of food. Number two, there's lots of things we can do with the food. And of course, you, you're going to have more than enough for your own consumption, for, for your own family and anybody else. So this is the design that I came up with for this piece of property. If you have any questions, please let me know. If you'd like a a uh, permaculture framework design like this one. Let me take a look at your property. Then you can go on earthcraftpermaculture.com. There's a link in the description here and and uh, you can purchase a framework design and then I'll call you up. We'll talk about it. Okay. So thank you very much for your time. God bless and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.